Borders. Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India, India's voice to the world. This is News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. Namaskar. Coming up in the next hour. India votes large queues at polling booths across the nation as voters brave heat, rain and terrain. Voting underway across 102 constituencies in the first phase of the country's general elections. Iran's state media reports shooting down three drones. EU Commission President calls on Iran, Israel and their allies to refrain from escalation. Israel has not owned responsibility for the reported infiltration. Twelve jurors selected in the Trump hush money trial. The former US President laments that he is in court rather than out on the campaign trail calls it really unfair. Young Indian Grandmaster Gukesh keeps Indian hopes alive as he shares the lead with American Nakamura and Russian Napom Niachi with two rounds left in the World Chess Championship Candidates Tournament. Now let's get you all the latest from the world's largest democratic election in India. Polling is taking place for the first phase of the Lok Sabha elections. This is to 102 constituencies across 21 states and union territories of India. Over 166.3 million voters are eligible to vote today. The first phase has the highest number of parliamentary constituencies among all the seven phases. And voting began at 7 in the morning and it's going to continue till 6 in the evening, Indian Standard Time, with a 60-minute window for voters who reach the polling booths uh, before the cutoff time and are in the queue when the booths close. Counting will take place for all these phases on the 4th of June. And for an update uh, on what's happening on the ground, Let's go across to our correspondents uh, from different uh, polling booths across India. Uh, we can see them here. Debiendu is joining us from Dibrugar, Anbarasan from Chennai, and Shishir from Nagpur. So uh, let me start with you, uh, Shishir. Uh, yesterday, when we talked to you, you said that it was really hot. Now it must be the hottest part of the day. Are we still seeing large queues uh, of people there? Well, absolutely, Mark. We have seen uh, since morning uh, the numbers we've got uh, till 11 o'clock. Uh, we have seen almost a 20 percent of voter turnout in Maharashtra. The number now have is increased. We'll get the numbers in just a couple of minutes. Uh, the voting till 1 o'clock, how much uh, the numbers has increased. Uh, but obviously, uh, the numbers compared to the last time, this time around, the numbers are quite good. And probably we hope that this time around the voting percentage will increase in Maharashtra because last time it was actually less uh, compared to the national average. But most important fact here, uh, this time around, we're not just showing how the polling is going on, but we're also showing our viewers that how uh, no, the election commission has prepared. And that's the reason we have reached one of the polling stations, which is uh, based on the environment theme. Uh, as you can see, I'll just tell my camera person to pan uh, and show these visuals to our viewers that how India is actually celebrating 
uh, no, the, no, uh, the, the celebration of the democracy here. Uh, and that's the reason this is one of the polling stations, as I told you, is based on theme, that is environment. Uh, so you see, you can see the green balloons here, uh, all the same, uh, the greenery at all the sides here. And that's the reason this kind of uh, initiative taken by the election commission so that they can attract more and more uh, voters. Uh, as a result, we have seen since morning, people are quite enthusiastic about it. We have seen uh, people you know, uh, at the age right. group of 89 or 90 uh, have also come to the, you know, uh, the polling stations and were voting uh, continuously. At the same time, we've also uh, seen some of the young voters, the first-time voters, they've also come in large numbers and voting. So obviously, uh, the maximum the voter turnout will see that the most strengthening the democracy becomes. Of course, issues and uh, other issues that we've already discussed here, but today... Uh, it all in the lies, you know, hands lies in the hands of uh, voters that what uh, they will decide, and that's the reason uh, voting percentage and voting turnout may increase because of the different action and initiatives taken by the election commission, the sweep activities, uh, the marathons, and the outreach program to uh, to, you know, uh, to reach to the people and to the voter, and that's the reason to bring them out from the houses and uh, you know, uh, con con uh, convince them to vote for the democracy. That's the entire. These are the yeah. initiatives taken by the election commission and the authority. As a result, we have seen here that the voting percentage are increasing. Probably till six o'clock in the evening, we hope that Maharashtra will break its own record compared to last time. Okay, let's move across uh, to Dibendu in uh, Dibrugad. Well, uh, we just witnessed uh, Dibendu a uh, green uh, election uh, polling booth, but you're in a really a green place uh, where, you know, you did stories about uh, tea gardens and things like that. So give us a little idea about the kind of issues that uh, people are voting for in uh, Dibrugad. Uh, well, Mark, of course, uh, you know, I am also at a model polling station here in uh, Dibrugarh uh, Parliamentary Constituency. Uh, let me first tell you uh, the polling percentage that has uh, been reported by the Election Commission at uh, 1 p.m. So, of course, uh, the 2 p.m. polling data is still not updated. And uh, till 1 p.m., as per the ele uh, Election Commission's uh, official uh, website, the voting turnout in Assam has been about 45% and of which uh, about 44.75% uh, is the voting uh, voter turnout in this particular constituency of Dibrugarh. Uh, I am at a mol uh, model polling station, so of course, uh, you know, the Election Commission has put up uh, selfie booths, and apart from that, wheelchair facility ramps have been made uh, by the Election Commission uh, to uh, uh, facilitate uh, any disabled or uh, divyang uh, uh, voters who would come here. Uh, they have also made uh, special arrangements for uh, sitting for the senior citizens as well as uh, arrangements for uh, uh, feeding mothers. So, of course, uh, you know, these are some of the key initiatives taken yes. by the Election Commission to ensure uh, more voter turnout. Uh, but uh, as you asked, uh, the issues on which the people would be voting uh, have been, in fact, voting uh, in this particular constituency, of course, uh, which makes up a significant chunk of voters is the tea garden workers and their issues play a very important role in deciding who the candidate would win from this particular constituency. So, uh, yes. so of course, uh, about 30% vote bank from this a uh, particular constituency constitutes uh, the tea garden workers and they will absolutely play a very, very significant role uh, into who uh, is able to win from this seat. Uh, but remember, uh, it is Union Minister Sarbananda Sonowal of the BJP against uh, AJP's uh, Lurinjati Gogoi of uh, the India Alliance's joint candidate who is contesting from this particular seat. So, of course, uh, also we have witnessed uh, long queues and as, as the voting percentage also says, uh, that uh, a lot of voting has already taken place in this particular constituency and, and yes. for that matter in all the five uh, constituencies across uh, the state of Assam that is going to polls in this particular phase. So by the end of uh, 6 p.m. when the voting closes and the final number is out at about 7, 7.30 p.m., uh, the voting percentage is expected to be about uh, 70 to 75 percent is uh, what I understand from the figures of uh, 1 p.m. Back to you, Mark. Sure. Uh, large voter turnout expected across the country. Let's go across to Chennai. Uh, Anbar Hassan is standing by. Uh, we've been seeing, uh, Anbar Hassan, a lot of, uh, you know, star power coming out to vote early, uh, sending a signal, you know, that it's an important day. Uh, and Ch uh, the whole of Tamil Nadu is voting in one phase. So just put this into perspective for us. 
Uh, as a voter turnout at around 1 p.m. in all across all the 39 constituencies, it's a 1 p.m. rate. It's around 40 percent of uh, voter turnout. At it's a simulate with a equate with the temperature here actually from 38 to 48 uh -huh. degrees Celsius. So the voter turnout need to be increased in the evening. Maybe we can expect. And uh, the major the Dharmaburi constituency around the maximum 44 percentage of voter turnout. In the lowest part, uh, lowest point is in urban seats, particularly the Chennai constituencies. Right now we are at the central Chennai constituency where the voter turnout is a little bit lagging due to the uh, uh, weather maybe and also from the morning onwards, uh, 7 a.m. onwards, the star candidates, actors, Rajini Khan, Kamal Kabul Hasin, and Chief Minister M.K. Stalin, ADMK, uh, Edapadi K. Pandichami, and the BJP K. Annamalai, all are went on vote in the morning 7 a.m. Uh, to 8 a.m. onwards. So, they are sending a signal to across all the all the voters, and also they given the voting is a kind of a duty for the citizens. So, the voter town not need to be, uh, uh, we need to see the end of the day that how much right. it, uh, the voter turnout and also this particular election as uh, we already seen in the report it's a very significant for the cross country and also for Tamil Nadu so all uh, and also the election commission continuously escalated and uh, given a various uh, uh, facilities to the voters to reach the polling booth and also uh, the election commission has informed that above 80 person uh, 80 uh, age of uh, the voters they can send a special vehicle also if they are not able to reach and the polling uh, BLOs maybe can reach to the those voters so they will facilitate the vehicle to reach the polling booth okay. so getting the maximum maximum voter town out it should be a more target on that so the election commission also preparing that we need to wait and watch till the date till the day to end to see that what is the voter turnout. out indeed uh, also Anbarasan uh, since uh, you know the entire state is going to the polls in a single phase what actually happens after a person comes out and votes? Uh, do people, you know, go and sit down in restaurants, talk about politics uh, and things like that? Does that happen? Is that uh, the kind of culture? Yeah, of course. Actually, from the morning tea, at uh, the 7 o'clock, the uh, polling starts. People actually uh, gathered in uh, 6 a.m. onwards or maybe even 5 a.m. onwards in the tea stalls before the choosing their, uh, the candidate. So the discussion always went on after the voting. Also, people uh, waiting outside. Discussion going on. Who's which party you are voted? So kind of a uh, as, as a festival of democracy. The people are also in very much involved in this, and they encouraged, and also they talked up the issues, and uh, the both uh, all the alliance partners also put a, a stalls for the outside the booth, so they can uh, interact with the voters right. to help uh, facilitate the voters to reach the booth on the particular booth because some polling booths are various uh, two three polling booths are in a uh, in a collective manner they put actually so to yes. e ease them up and also facilitate the voter to reach that so they are also guiding that and also the police personnel the, the polling booth workers also very much into helping them from morning onwards so that as a festival of democracy okay uh, this is going on yeah uh, let's uh, go across uh, once again to Shashir. Uh, Shashir, you were uh, at uh, one of the model polling booths uh, uh, with an environment message. Uh, what actually happens, uh, you know, from the from the polling personnel's point of view after people vote? What do they do with uh, uh, the polling, uh, with the EVMs, how they stored, and things like that? For the sake of our international viewers, perhaps you can give them a guideline. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, Mark, uh, you rightly said here. You talked about what are the what are the point here, uh, stating that uh, you know, what kind of uh, environment here after the voting. I would add on to that uh, because uh, since morning we are seeing the people have been voting here, and what's interesting fact that is we are talking about the festival of democracy, and in a festival actually you get a good uh, discounts uh, when you go for the shopping or when you go for the outing, and that's what we've seen here also because those people who have been voting. Uh, and if they go to the, any restaurants here, and especially in Nagpur, some of the restaurants are offering 10% discounts on food. So people are quite joyous there, and that's the reason most of people come here with the family, with the friends, uh, they cast their vote, and then the entire team goes to the nearby hotel 
or the restaurants where these kind of uh, uh, yes. uh, discounts is open and the hotels are open to give discounts by seeing the mark on their finger that yes, uh, they have cast their vote and they can come in the seat and they talk. So obviously, uh, it's absolute festive mood since morning. Uh, we have witnessed uh, in and around Nagpur. Uh, even though uh, we have seen some of the uh, no, uh, parliamentarians also and some of the leaders also after cast, uh, no, casting their vote, uh, they come to the media, they talk and then probably they go to uh, some of the nearest place to have a cup of tea or have a cup of coffee uh, along with the people there and to chat that exactly the lighter note that uh, how the voting is going on and how the more, more and more people should come out. So it's not just authorities here, uh, but I would say that the entire environment, especially the restaurants, the hotels, uh, also contributing and probably attracting more and more voters us to come in large number and vote and enjoy their cup of coffee right. or tea Absolutely. at the nearby restaurants by taking a discounts as well. Indeed. Uh, let's turn once again to Dibrugar. Uh, so, uh, Dibindu, you know, when people come out to vote, uh, there is a chance that they have, a, you know, to interact. Uh, after all, they are participating in a democratic process. They are electing a government. They are electing a leader. Uh, is there a chance for them, you know, to meet uh, people from political parties afterwards? talk about the issues that they have in mind, because otherwise, in the campaign mode, they didn't probably have a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with, uh, with the people concerned. Oh, well, you know, while the voting process is going on, so of course, uh, you know, when the political leaders come to this, uh, their particular polling station, they do interact uh, with the people that are already in the queue. Uh, as in this case, we saw with uh, the BJP candidate here, Sarbananda Sonowal, when in the morning at about 8 a.m., he came uh, to vote uh, uh, at his particular polling station. Uh, uh, he interacted with a couple of, uh, you know, voters that were standing uh, in queue. Uh, he even obliged to a lot of uh, voters who wanted to take a selfie with him. So, of course, you know, they do interact uh, with the leaders, but, uh, you know, uh, going to their uh, particular house and interacting uh, with them is, uh, is it's not something that is generally done after the voting is done. But, of course, uh, when the leaders are out, uh, when the leaders are visiting, uh, you know, their, uh, uh, their polling uh, stations across their constituency, they do interact with the voters. But, of course, uh, you have to keep in mind, Mark, uh, as per the ECI rules, uh, mm. the candidate cannot canvass uh, or yes. uh, talk about... Uh, whom to vote or whom not to vote with the voters when they are uh, in 100 meter perimeter of uh, the polling station. So, of course, uh, all sorts of uh, political messaging uh, within the perimeter of 100 uh, meters uh, radius is not permitted by the ECI. So, of course, all the political candidates do uh, keep that in mind. And it is uh, a general interaction with the public that are uh, that have come out to vote. And uh, the, uh, the contesting candidate, of course, uh, has to go to uh, uh, all booths across his constituencies to ensure that everything is peaceful and uh, all the uh, polling machines and the EVMs are working fine or uh, everything is being right. carried out peacefully. So this is uh, generally what happens in India when uh, elections are uh, happening and uh, the candidates do visit uh, almost all the polling stations apart from the fact uh, that there are also polling agents that are nominated by the candidate who take care of the polling yes. stations because uh, in India we have a large parliamentary constituency and there are almost uh, hundreds of polling booths uh, that are spread across uh, sometimes even districts. So, of course, it is not possible for a candidate to go to all booths. So, they have their polling agents uh, who are also political leaders. So, they do keep uh, visiting all these polling booths and interact yes. with the people. But having said this, again, no political messaging, no political campaigning allowed within the 100-meter perimeter of uh, the polling stations. Thank you very much for that Back clarification, uh, uh, Dibiendu, uh, also Shishir and Anbarasan. Thank you for putting this into perspective for us. Uh, an overview and understanding from the ground of uh, how the electoral process is uh, taking place in India, first phase of the big general election. Let's move on then. Uh, the Election Commission of India has urged citizens to join in uh, celebrating Chunav Ka Parv, or the festival of elections where every vote counts. <laughs> I would like to appeal to the voters that elections belong to you. We are handing over the baton to you. Please come and vote. We have youth will not only vote, but we will ambassadors. The entire team in the ECI is ready to ink the voters. Please join us. 
Well, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called on the youth and first-time voters to vote in large numbers in a social media post on X, the Prime Minister wrote. As 102 seats across 21 states and UTs go to the polls, I urge all those voting in these seats to exercise their franchise in record numbers. I particularly call upon the young and first-time voters to vote in large numbers. After all, every vote counts and every voice matters. And moving on, explosions were heard in Iran's uh, Ishfahan city. Iran's Ishfahan city. This is uh, as the country had activated its air defense systems in what the media reports uh, are describing as a response to an Israeli strike. However, Iran is yet to confirm the strike. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Israel is yet to confirm the strike, which happened uh, last week's uh, uh, unprecedented Iranian attack on Israeli, on Israeli installations. Uh, according to the state media of Iran, three drones which were spotted in the sky over Isfahan, they were destroyed by the air defenses. Iran also closed its airports in Tehran, Shiraz and Isfahan. Uh, Isfahan houses the Natanz nuclear site and the International Atomic Energy Agency has confirmed that there was no damage to the site. As tensions reached a tipping point in West Asia, the European Union's chief, Ursula von der Leyen, has called on Israel and Iran to refrain from escalation. We have to do all, everything possible that all sides restrain from the escalation in that region. Um, we have seen the massive attack with drones and missiles, around about 300, uh, by Iran on Israel. Um, it is absolutely necessary that the region stays stable and that all sides refrain from further action. Meanwhile, Iran has warned Israel against a military strike addressing the United Nations Security Council. The Iranian Foreign Minister, Hossein Amir Abdullahain, said that Tehran would not hesitate in responding to any Israeli military action. Certainly, in case of any use of force by the Israeli regime and of violating our sovereignty, the Islamic Republic of Iran will not hesitate a bit to assert its inherent rights, to give a decisive and proper response to it, to make the regime regret its actions. Now, uh, DD India's Sarah Coates now joins us from Tel Aviv with an update on the story. Sarah, what is Israel saying about the reported drone strike on Iran? Hello there, Mark. No official comment yet from the Israelis. All we've heard really from the military is that the advice to the public has not changed. And really, there is a lot of calm here on the ground given what has happened. And if you put that into comparison to what we saw just a week ago, there were people out withdrawing money. They were panic buying generators. They were stocking up on food and that type of thing. But now, if you look down at the beach, there are hundreds of people surfing. There are parents walking their dogs and uh, taking their little babies for a stroll. So certainly, uh, it does appear right now that this threat could be over. Of course, uh, this can change any moment. But it appears that the Iranians are really downplaying this incident. A number of uh, senior commanders have spoken to Iranian state media. They've come out to say that there are no reports of an attack from abroad, that these were infiltrators from inside the country. So what this has really done, what it appears to have done, is given the Iranians the opportunity to save face. And then on the other hand, give Israel the ability uh, to show that it can actually attack, if indeed this was Israel, widely believed to be Israel, uh, inside Iranian territory. Also, Sarah, given the, you know, the tensions and uh, the feeling that there's escalation taking place, what's the reaction among the common Israelis about a potential escalation with, is with Iran? Uh, how far are they willing to support a military confrontation? Uh, given the fact that they are walking around on the beach, they may not be, uh, you know, too concerned at the moment. 
Well, if you put this into comparison to a week ago, the mood is extremely difficult, uh, different rather, Mark. Uh, a week ago, people were extremely worried. This was an unprecedented attack. We do need to remember last Saturday, some 300 ballistic missiles, drones launched at the state of Israel. But really, we need to look at the success of the aerial defences in the region. The military saying that some 99% of those missiles, those drones, were shot down. So this has really given people here uh, a greater sense of security. But it is important also to point out that people here in Israel are very much used to living in, we could call it, I think, a, a war mode type of scenario. There are already th or always threats from around the region, and this is something that certainly uh, people have become used to. Now, when it comes to how much uh, support there would be for a military escalation, the broad consensus here on the ground after Saturday's unprecedented attack uh, last Saturday is that the broad consensus of people really believe that there needed to be a response, that Iran cannot go and shoot uh, this amount of missiles and drones into the country without going unpunished, Mark. Okay, we leave it there. Thank you very much, Sarah Coates, for joining us from Tel Aviv. Earlier, the UN chief Antonio Guterres called on uh, both these parties to de-escalate in West Asia, saying that uh, the recent escalations uh, make it even more important to support efforts to find a lasting peace. The Middle East is on a precipice. Recent days have seen a perilous escalation in words and deeds. One miscalculation one miscommunication, one mistake, could lead to the unthinkable, a full-scale regional conflict that would be devastating for all involved and for the rest of the world. The moment of maximum peril must be a time for maximum restraint. A jury has been sworn in for the Donald Trump criminal hush money trial, and the trial began on Monday with the ex-president facing 34 counts of falsifying business records related to allegations of paying hush money to an adult film actress or an actor before the 2016 election. Trump denies these charges. William Denslow reports from outside the courthouse in New York. The 12 people that will decide ultimately Donald Trump's fate in this criminal hush money case have been decided. This comes after a rather frantic and fraught day uh, of jury selection here in Lower Manhattan. The day began with seven members of the 12 member panel already confirmed. Two though swiftly dropped out during morning proceedings, one citing concerns that her identity, despite jurors being anonymous, uh, being made public because of uh, how she was described in the media. Another uh, was uh, dismissed on credibility concerns without uh, the judge providing many details on that. However, in a flurry of activity uh, during the afternoon session here at court, uh, the other members of the jury have been confirmed. They have now been sworn in, which means that a jury is in place. Judge Juan Machan hopes uh, that they will come back on Monday for opening statements in this case for Donald Trump's hush money trial to really begin in earnest. Donald Trump's pleaded not guilty to 34 charges uh, tied to allegations of falsifying business records. Donald Trump has spoken after the jury was sworn in. He has again railed against this case. He says that it is election interference. He says that he has done nothing wrong. He says uh, that this is all a bid to harm his re-election campaign. This trial could last up to two months and he says that that is time he'd otherwise be spending on the campaign trail. There is also the matter of Donald Trump's gag order. Prosecutors allege that Donald Trump has been violating it and they warned that that could uh, bring with it the possibility of up to uh, a fine or up to 30 days behind bars. Donald Trump says the gag order is unconstitutional. He's consistently asked for the judge to drop it and a hearing on the matter of whether he's been violating that order is scheduled for Tuesday. William Denslow in New York reporting for DD India. Well, still to come here on DD India News Hour. Vice Admiral Dinesh Kumar Tripathi 
to be India's next Navy chief. The first set of BrahMos launchers and missiles delivered to the Philippines. And Traditional knowledge can often help us gain new prospects for the future. Speaking of traditions, what did you have for lunch today? We thought that through Sputnik Farms, uh, we can try to create more resilient and more sustainable kind of food system. We wanted to recover the art of weaving we knew as children. We founded the Nurupu Collective, which aims to improve the situation of weavers here. By working with this parametric modeling, we can change uh, the city and uh, visualize it in, in several different ways. So that's a very strong uh, mechanism in the digital twin, just working with parametric uh, visualization. In the IPCC, we have a range of different you know, climate modeling scenarios ranging from low emission scenarios to really high emission scenarios and kind of everything in between. You're watching DD India News, huh? I'm Mark Lynn. Here's a recap of our main stories. India votes large queues at polling booths across the nation as voters brave heat, rain and terrain. Voting underway across 102 constituencies in the first phase of the country's general elections. Iran's state media reports shooting down three drones. The EU Commission president calls on Iran, Israel and their allies to refrain from escalation. Israel has not owned responsibility for the reported infiltration. Twelve jurors selected in the Trump hush money trial. The former U.S. president laments that he is in court rather than on the campaign trail. Calls it really unfair. Well, phase one of uh, voting for India's general elections has begun. Uh, it began this morning with much zeal, as we can see. And with the elections as a central part of the largest democracy of the world, the wave of enthusiasm is a telltale indicator of the voters' will to decide their future. Let's take a look at this report. Voters across all the 102 constituencies of the first phase of India's Lok Sabha elections are casting their votes on Friday. With estimated number of voters to be around 160 million, the fervor of the voting season is a sight to behold. Important personalities and politicians were also seen among the lines of the polling booths. They took part in the electoral process and encouraged other voters to also exercise their right to vote. Among eminent voters were Mohan Bhagwat, the chief of Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, who exercised his franchise in Maharashtra's Nagpur. Arunachal Pradesh CM Pema Khandu also cast his vote in Tawang. Meghalaya CM Conrad K. Sangma cast his vote in Tura. Uttarakhand CM Pushkar Singh Dhami also cast his vote. Celebrities are also taking the elections as an important duty in country's democratic process. Actors Rajnikant, Kamal Hassan and Dhanush were also seen queuing up at their nearest polling stations to cast their votes. Spiritual Guru Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev also cast his vote in Tamil Nadu's Coimbatore. The season of election coincides with the auspicious wedding season. Responsible married couples completed their duty of casting their ballot by taking time out of their wedding rituals. While a newly wed bridegroom delays the procession of Bidai for voting at Bhaderva in Jammu and Kashmir, a married couple in Jammu and Kashmir's Udhampur were seen at a polling booth to cast their vote right after their marriage ceremony. When I told them that they should go to vote, and I told them that they should not waste their vote. They should give them a good vote, and they should give them a good time to vote. They should give them a good time. Innovative ways have been deployed by the election officials to attract voters to polling booths. One such example was a bamboo and forest theme 
polling station in Katta of Ramtek constituency of Maharashtra. The Nagpur district administration hopes that the voters will get a new experience with this unique concept. One of the largest election processes in the world has begun with much buzz and energy. The citizens of India acknowledge the voting period as a chance to exercise their right and fulfill their necessary demands and needs. Bureau report, DD India. Well, indeed, India's uh, Gautam Roy now joins us from Gangtok in Sikkim. Uh, well, uh, Gautam, uh, Sikkim is unique in a sense that it's a double engine and, uh, election. Uh, they're voting for the assembly as well as for the Lok Sabha. So, uh, you know, put that into context. Uh, after all, people are voting in a sense for both the federal as well as the state government. Yes, Mark, you're quite right. Uh, it is a double engine and uh, you can also call it a triple engine or treble engine because uh, there is, uh, as I had sent in a previous report, a Sangha seat as well in the uh, assembly, the uh, Sikkim assembly, which is a virtual seat. It doesn't have a geographical boundary. Only uh, monks uh, and nuns of uh, the Buddhist faith uh, who are there all over Sikkim and over 40 monasteries, they vote there. There are very few of them, uh, barely 3,000 uh, count, but... Uh, they have a separate uh, EVM set up in designated polling booths. So in that way, it becomes a, a treble, uh, in fact, election. And uh, things are going pretty well over here. Uh, till about 1 p.m., uh, around 36.8% of people had voted for uh, the assembly election. 36.75% had voted for the parliamentary seat, the lone parliamentary seat in Sikkim. The weather was uh, a bit inclement uh, uh, mm. on the days preceding uh, the election, but today... Uh, in the morning, uh, sunshine was there, uh, people came out in large numbers. Even now, you can see behind me, there are a lot, there's a huge amount of crowd. Uh, you can see uh, the people queuing up at this uh, polling station, some of them uh, being lined up uh, for uh, more than two and a half hours for their uh, turn to come. Uh, but they are being uh, quite patient and being quite uh, responsible where their uh, right to exercise franchise is concerned, their responsibility to exercise as franchise is concerned. Yes, also... Uh uh, Gautam, uh, when we were talking to our uh, other correspondents in different parts of the country and, uh, you know, trying to describe uh, the festival of democracy in India, uh, they were saying that, you know, people after they vote, they generally go out and uh, sit together uh, at a restaurant, perhaps talk politics. Some go and they also get discounts uh, on polling day uh, at uh, certain places. So, I mean, is there such an atmosphere in Sikkim as well? Well, yes, sir. one could say that it is an out-and-about kind of a day because uh, people are given a day off uh, today to exercise their franchise and uh, people make uh, best use of that. Uh, right now, of course, uh, the concern has been uh, people calling up uh, those who are here to find out uh, uh, how long is the queue. Uh, should I come now or should I come a little later? And uh, there are others who say, OK, there's a really nice crowd out there. I can maybe meet my neighbors or friends and let me come over there and uh, get a chit-chat uh, going. Mm -hmm. So. There's two kinds of perspectives on that, and after voting, people uh, uh, head out or head home and have a uh, nice, uh, relaxing uh, time as well, which could be going to restaurants or uh, just uh, staying at home with family. Okay, we leave there. Thanks very much, Gautam, for joining us uh, with an update from Gang Talk. And Amit Mukherjee now joins us from the newsroom with an overview of the first day of the seven-phase elections that kicked off in India today. Amit, um, you know, let's try and analyze these elections is this uh, an indirect election or is it a direct election for the federal government of India? Well, Mark, if you look at the election structure out here in India, it's very different from what we see uh, uh, happens in the U.S. Actually, in India, it's the, it's, it's the people who actually elect their local representatives who eventually decide on the incumbent government. Now, for this purpose, India has been di divided into 543 parliamentary constituencies. And at every parliamentary constituency, there's an election that happens. Now, once a person gets elected from there, he goes on to the uh, Lok Sabha, which is the lower house of the Indian Parliament and actually it's the strength of those elected uh, representatives now mind you these elected uh, repre these representatives they fight elections under the banner of a political party or they can also fight it individually now once they get elected at the level of the parliament the, uh, the party which has got the maximum representation actually gets to form the incumbent government the next government now having said that mark I would also like to bring to uh, our viewers 
uh, knowledge that you know it's it's a era of coalition coalition politics in india where there are a lot of pre poll and post poll alliances now even political parties they get into pre poll and post poll alliances now the alliance that secures the maximum representation again in the indian parliament they get to form the government mark indeed uh, and uh, so 102 uh, seats are going to the polls today and so far according to what we've been seeing there have been uh, large queues a uh, high voter turnout what does this imply no mark this is reflective of the fact that india's democracy is i mean it's participated very well by the citizens of the country and also the election commission which is actually the watchdog and it's also responsible for conducting the elections in the country have been running a lot of campaigns a lot of awareness campaigns to actually get voters into voting now it has been telling voters about their rights and what is it what does it mean to be part of the election process and it's actually their right this is what they have been conveying that it's very very important it's a duty for all the citizens of the country to be a part of this election process so i think a good voter turnout is reflective of the part of, of the fact that the the message has gone out well to the uh, to the to the uh, to the people of the country and they are also looking forward to the new government for which they are participating in large numbers mark amit mukherjee from the newsroom thanks very much now uh, vice admiral dinesh kumar tripathi has been appointed as the next chief of the indian navy tripathi has served as the vice chief of the naval staff and executed uh, multiple important assignments in his 40 year long career he was uh, in fact he will assume charge of his new office on the 30th of April. Born on May 15, 1964, Vice Admiral Dinesh Kumar Tripathi was commissioned into the executive branch of the Indian Navy on July 1, 1985. India has delivered the first set of BrahMos launchers and missiles ordered by the Philippines. The storage building space is in one of the Philippines islands as part of the $374.96 million deal signed in January of 2022 is also completed. The contract, which was the first major international export order for the Indian defense space, is uh, for a shore-based variant of the anti-ship cruise missile with a range of 290 kilometers. The BrahMos is the only supersonic cruise missile in the world that flies at three times the speed of sound. Pakistan police shot down a suicide bomber and a terrorist on Friday while they attacked a vehicle carrying five Japanese nationals in Karachi. All of the victims were rescued. Some of Pakistan's deadliest assaults in recent years have been carried out by Islamist militants who sometimes target foreigners, including Chinese, in their quest to overthrow the government and impose their own harsh brand of Islamic law. A police spokesperson stated that the Japanese survivors had been taken to a secure location within police custody. No militant group has claimed responsibility as yet for this attack. The Air Forces of South Korea and the United States kicked off a 15-day joint drill known as Korea Flying Training. It happened last Friday with uh, 100 warplanes. The exercises are an annual event designed to sharpen the combined readiness of their military forces. The Special Operation Forces from the two countries also staged an airborne training exercise with paratroopers as part of the annual drills. Let's see what's making news around the world. Ten people, including Kenya's military chief, General Francis Ogola, died after their military helicopter crashed shortly after takeoff on Thursday. Their bodies were returned to Nairobi. An air investigation has been launched. Beneath the pristine waters of Thailand Island, uh, an environmental threat looms large as divers work to disentangle abandoned fishing gear from coral, which have trapped unsuspecting fish inside. As of 2023, the percentage of endangered marine animals affected by plastic pollution in the Andaman Sea rose by roughly 30 to 40 percent. Over 80,000 certified divers have initiated to help, uh, you know, these marine scientists remove this. Music streaming giant Spotify has revealed that Taylor Swift's upcoming album 
became the most pre-saved album countdown page in Spotify history. On average, nearly 70% of the users have pre-saved the album this week. So that's week one, in fact. Taylor's uh, album was released, will release on Friday. And it was a party outside the famous TCL Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard as the stars of the classic film Pulp Fiction celebrated the 30 years of this film. The screening of the classic film kicked off uh, day one of the TCM Film Festival where fans have the chance to interact with some of Hollywood's biggest names through meet and greets. Still to come here on DD India News Hour. Elon Musk readies for a trip uh, to talk one on one with Prime Minister Modi. Resurge in Chennai Super Kings to take on Lucknow Super Giants in the Indian Premier League. Uganda's national cricket team is set to make a debut in the upcoming T20 World Cup in June. Details after the break. Tracking the first phase of general elections, Team Pole Pulse has reached India's northeast in Assam. This is the tea city of India, Dibrugarh. They are not getting jobs in the local area, like in Dibrugarh or nearby districts and all. Home to the finest tea, the state is set for a cracker of a contest. This is 2024. Can the Congress and allies offer a fight back or will the Modi Jagannath be unstoppable? Watch Pole Pulse on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Mark Lynn. Uh, Elon Musk is reading for a trip to India. It appears he would be packing a hefty investment in his suitcase. According to Reuters, the electric vehicle Mogul plans to announce a two to three billion dollar investment when he meets uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday. Tony Waterman reports from Texas. According to the Reuters report, this two to three billion dollars will mainly go towards the building of a new Tesla factory. Right now, the details are thin on where the factory could be located or when it could be operational. But in the meantime, Tesla is scouting out potential showroom locations in New Delhi and Mumbai. That is according to Reuters. Those cars could be imported from its plant in Germany, which would allow Tesla to take advantage of a new tariff rule change. Uh, just last month, India slashed taxes on imported electric vehicles to 15 percent for automakers that invest $500 million in the country and set up a factory. Tesla already has manufacturing capabilities in the U.S., Europe, and China, but this new facility will give it access to a brand new market, and not just any old market. India has the world's largest population, and the government wants 30 percent of all new car sales to be EVs starting in 2030. This entry into the India market could also help Tesla offset plunging sales growth elsewhere. Just this week, the company said it was laying off more than 10 percent of its global workforce after reporting its first annual decline in deliveries since the pandemic. But cars aren't the only thing that Musk is keen to focus on during this two-day visit. He's also expected to meet with Indian space startups in New Delhi on Monday, including Skyroot Aerospace in Satshore. Uh, this could help pave the way for a market entry for SpaceX's Starlink, a satellite internet provider, as Elon Musk eyes India as the next frontier for a number of his business ventures. Tony Waterman in Austin, Texas, reporting for DD India. Well, now let's get you all the latest from the Asian stock markets and Tokyo's key Nikkei index. It saw its largest drop in more than three years on Friday, following reports that Israel carried out strikes on Iran. The Shanghai Composite Index has declined by 0.29 percent. And the Indian markets, well, the Nifty is at over 22,000 points. The Sensex is up by around 530 points. The biggest gainers are Bharati Airtel, Bajaj Finance, 
And uh, the biggest losers include HCL Technologies and Infosys. Time now for all the sports updates. And for that, let's turn to Abhishek Mahajan. Over to you, Abhishek. Thank you, Mark. A lot happening in sports. And we'll start with the chess story, chess candidate story. The youngest player in the World Chess Championship candidates tournament, D. Gukesh, just 17 years is in the lead with just two rounds left to decide the challenger to world champion Ding Lijian in a title match. Gukesh is on 7.5 points after 12 rounds along with Russian in Nipomnishi and American Hikaru Nakamura. Behind them is world number two Fabiano Caruana on seven points. The others in the field are technically out of the race. Pragnananda on six points is slightly out of reach of the leaders as they approach the home stretch. If Gukesh wins, he will be the youngest player ever to challenge the world crown. Both Kasparov and Koslin were 22 when they became world champions. Shifting focus to cricket now, Chennai Super Kings will take on Lucknow Super Giants in the 34th match of the Indian Premier League 2024 in Lucknow on Friday. Chennai Super Kings won both their last two matches. CSK looked rather impressive in the wins against Kolkata Knight Riders at home and then against Mumbai Indians in away game. Lucknow Super Giants, on the other hand, are struggling to find their rhythm back after having been outplayed in their last two games against Delhi and KKR as they will be looking to bounce back with a win. Before those two defeats, Kale Rahul's men had recorded three wins in a row. Talking about yesterday's game, Mumbai Indians clinched a nail-biting win by nine runs over Punjab Kings in the Indian Premier League on Thursday. Surya Kumar Yadav top scored for Mumbai Indians with his 78-run knock, while Tilak Varma remained unbeaten at 34 of 18 deliveries. Rohit Sharma contributed with a 38-run innings at the top of the order, while Harshal Patel starred with the ball for Kings as he registered a three-wicket haul. Meanwhile, Punjab Kings got off to the most horror start, losing four wickets in just two overs as Gerald Koizia and Jaspreet Bumrah wreaked havoc over the top order of Punjab Kings. But a sensational 28 ball 61 from Ashutosh brought them back out of nowhere. The match went on to the last over, eventually losing the game by nine runs. Now, Uganda's national cricket team is set to make a debut in the upcoming T20 World Cup in June. Three of the current Ugandan squad are Indian origin as the East African side heads to its first ever T20 finals. Near India's Leon Sassanyange reports from Kampala. Born in Gujarat, India, Ronak Patel expected to find leader of the game of cricket when he came to Uganda. In India, I have played almost 12 years. And after that, I moved here and I am playing here. Ronak is one of three players of Indian origin playing for Uganda's cricket team. He will be part of the East African side that will play at this year's T20 Cricket World Cup in the West Indies and the United States of America from 2nd to 30th June. We are very excited and uh, for reaching a T20 World Cup, it's a proud, proud, proud moment for Uganda Cricket Association and whole nation. In a debut appearance at the competition, Uganda will face Afghanistan in their opening match on the 3rd of June. Contests against New Zealand, West Indies and Papua New Guinea are lined up in Group C. It's uh, exciting to play at the World Cup, but it's important to go out there and play good cricket. Uh, we want to give a good account of ourselves. Uh, you know, that's how you'll be remembered, the, the brand of cricket that you played, and it's very important for us as a country playing there for the first time. The squad is already putting in all the work ahead of the competition. The T20 World Cup cricket experience has not yet started for this team, but their ambitions are already beyond it. Hopefully a good show in West Indies could spur momentum to reach the ODI World Cup in 2027. The National Cricket Association has laid out its plans for that journey too. As an association, we know that the plans and the strategies that we had have have worked so we can only increase um, on them we can only continue putting uh, more resources to help uh, Uganda if, to participate even in, in more competitions the immediate task though is the T20 Cricket World Cup the goal is to attack the field go all out and possibly leave a mark Leon Sonyange 
in Kampala, Uganda, reporting for DD India. Well, that's all we have in Spot Stories. Back to you, Mark. Well, Abhishek, what are the chances then for Uganda in the T20 World Cup? I mean, first match will set the tone. They'll play against Afghanistan. But yes, they have beaten good teams. Uh, Kenya, who played uh, semi-final in 1996. And then uh, they have beaten the teams like Ghana. Let's see how they play in the World Cup. But yes, a big, big moment for them. Okay. Moving on. In Thailand, the uh, Lam Che Dam area. What's happened is that spectators are enjoying a beautiful sight as millions of butterflies of various species take flight in Taplan National Park. These butterflies with their diverse species and stunning colors showcase the richness of the forest ecosystem in this national park. Well, that's all we have in this edition of DD India News Hour. Let's know your thoughts on the news of the day. For those of you on the go, you can get all the latest updates of, from India and across the world on DD India mobile app. The app is available for, on both Android and iOS platforms. Scan that, skia, that QR code that you can see on your screen and download it. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Mark Lin and with me is Abhishek. And from all of us here in Delhi, thanks very much for watching DD India News R. Namaskar. Traditional knowledge can often help us gain new prospects for the future. Speaking of traditions, what did you have for lunch today? We thought that through Sputnik Farms, uh, we can try to create more resilient and more sustainable kind of food system. We wanted to recover the art of weaving we knew as children. We founded the Nurupu Collective, which aims to improve the situation of weavers. By working with this parametric modeling, we can change uh, the city and uh, visualize it in, in several different ways. So that's a very strong uh, mechanism in the digital twin, just working with parametric uh, visualization. In the IPCC, we have a range of different you know, climate modeling scenarios ranging from low emission scenarios to really high emission scenarios and kind of everything in between. As the cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024 the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian Election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. Yaki hai khud par. Khud par hai naaz. Sunti hu apne man ki awaz. <laughs> Kabhi sharmili. तो कभी हूँ जाबाज रुकना मेरी आदत नहीं थमना मेरी चाहत नहीं मैं हूँ नारी यही मेरा अंदाज हर जिम्मेदारी मैं बखूबी निभाती हूँ वोट दे प्राउड वोटर कहलाऊंगी पूरे देश संग चुनाव का पर्व मनाऊंगी World's largest democracy's first of seven phases is set to kick off on April 19 for 1,625 candidates. 102 constituencies within 21 states and union territories are voting. Eight union ministers, 
two former chief ministers and one ex-governor's fate will be decided by over 166.3 million voters. The Great Indian election tracks all the numbers as they unfold at 8.30 p.m. IST, 1500 hours GMT, only on DD India. Tracking the first phase of general elections, Team Pole Pulse has reached India's northeast in Assam, 